the sixth man there is, is uh, it's indicated that the, uh, that's that's flat around from the 1935 to, but uh, anyway, it, it was amazing uh, that his son reached out to me and and, and, and told me how, how important it was for um, for for his family. He would have his father to be on the on the other crew, and that's what. Um, indeed, your own community at UCLA is a family. We root for each other, we care for each other, and we support each other. By the end of the evening, I'm certain that each of you will feel that you are a part of the special family. You know, you know, that way. For me personally, growing and studying at UCLA uh, formed me into the man that I am today. It is why I contribute more to UCLA growing than I do to U.S. growing when I was on several national teams. I'm forever indebted to Coach Bob Newman to pull me aside as I was walking on the walk, to show me the eight-man show that was on display, and to ask me if I had ever thought about growing. Perhaps I'll share more of this story with you. We not only thank you for raising the fine men and women who we are all, who we've all been meeting with in this, but also for showing up tonight. And if we have organized the Bruin Duo cocktail that some of you are thinking. And, yeah. and he also produced the introductory video that we just watched. You can see. Nick Seeger's Jules mom has been another particularly active member of the current care group, and she put me in touch with the McManus Family Library, which is not in our life this evening, at a deep discount address. Both of these parents have provided items to purchase and are signing off, so be sure to check them out. There, there's always a need for active parents to attend their guidance, provide healthy food and drinks for the athletes to keep the food spirit alive. So if you're not already doing so, get active with the parent group. Really important. I'd also like to thank all of the alumni who have come far, have overcome their coronavirus concerns, who continue to make it possible for UCLA men's growing to compete and whose vision includes returning this program to greatness. Many of you are celebrating significant anniversaries this year. I'd like for the alums who are celebrating anniversaries to stand as I call out the decade that you wrote. No, it could have been a frosh, novice, JV, or varsity version during the years that I would announce in order to have had an anniversary. For example, if you're a second year or in 1999 2000, you should stand when I call that year. Given this definition of celebrating an anniversary, if you were a member of the 2009-2010 UCLA Men's Crew celebrating your 10th anniversary, please stand. UCLA Men's Crew celebrating your 20th anniversary. Please stand. All right. Um, for the, if you were a member of the 1989-1990 crew celebrating your, your 30th anniversary, please stand. Through celebrating your 50th 
anniversary. Please stand.
grasp your ability, your ability, the world can be yours. While at UCLA, David was a water polo player in 1948, he changed his focus to crew going for the next four years. He wrote on technical crew and then spoke to varsity eight for the next three years. As a three time varsity veteran, David received a lifetime pass to all UCLA athletic events. David also served as team captain of the UCLA crew for two years. Finally, he served as crew representative on the men's athletic board as part of the student government. David coached the UCLA Threshold in 1956 and 1957. In addition, David coached Brad Lewis in 1984 with the gold medalist in the the year before the Olympic LA Games. In addition, he coached the Long Beach Lightweight Women's Cox Squad, who were three times U.S. National gold medalists, and which had a new course record for the 1,000 years ago. His wife, Winnie, was known to all three of those victims. During David's first year of track coach, he started in the fall with five miles record. By the end of the season, he had two and a half points on one. They won five out of six regardless they were in that season, and by the end of that season, they were even worse. David advised that was a big mistake. The, coach, the head coach fired him at the bank for that. Did not coach call the player ever again. <laughs> David continues to row almost every day at the Newport Athletic Center. Coach David Rich, thank you very much for service to UCLA Men's Group. UCLA coach Edward Barry, please stand. So Ed graduated from UCLA in 1954 with a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration. In addition, he received certificates in government contracting and information business systems from UCLA. And he received his MBA from California Lutheran University in 1974. As a rower at UCLA, he had to drop the road down in the special in 1949 and 1950 season. During the 1951, 52, and 53 seasons, he went down in the RCA, with the exception of one race, where he won the three seasons of JD Lake and his cow. And coach Franklin during the 1953-54 season. And he recalls that two major things happened during the 1954 season. It was the first time that the post-World War II World War II years that the UCLA race long distance, two miles from the freshman and three miles from the varsity. And UCLA defeated Stanford for the first time. The freshman by three lengths and varsity by 15 lengths. Yes, 15. The freshman also had a good year by also defeating USC and Orange Coast College. Their only defeat was the college. As a side note, the Stanford freshman had defeated the varsity during the workouts prior to the meeting with USC and UCLA. Being unbeatable, they wore they were monogrammed shirts for the first of the national race to tell the end of the season. Too bad they lost it. Coach Edward Berry, thank you very much for your service. You see only most of it. You see only Coach Gary Johnson. Please stand. Gary graduated from Rutgers University in 1964 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in History and Minor in Mathematics, and from Whitworth University in 1975. He did not go to UCLA, but he had a very distinguished career as a Husky resident. He spoke of the use of the UW Prop crew in 61 and then in the He won the IRA by 12 seconds over the death. Further, he was still to the UW in 1962, 63, and 64 until the 1964 IRA retired, where the spring four seniors, including Jerry, were moved into the JV votes. That said, I only made the spring four more determined. And they ended up winning the IRAs, carrying the California varsity winning time by six seconds. That same UW JVA went on to road the only process ever and limited the UW varsity game in a qualifying game. <laughs> Not bad. As coach at UCLA, Jerry was our freshman coach from the fall of 66 to the spring of 68. A varsity head coach, and he became our varsity head coach from the fall. 
UCLA in 1979, the Bachelor of Arts in Economics, and I'll speak more in 1982 as a master's of science. As a rural UCLA, Jim was a cook for the varsity in 1969, and 60 captain of the varsity in 1970. Jim coached the freshman in 1971 and 1972 and 1972. In each of the three years, Jim coached the freshman.
was 67 before he passed away. He was UCLA, where he graduated in 1968 with a bachelor of science degree from Mississippi State. Bob Condon and Kerber, yes, you could argue the point that I majored in crew and minor in Mississippi State. Bob began his career in 1966 while at Orange Coast College, where his VA crew was undefeated and called finishing second to the University of Washington at the Western Center. As a five man in UCLA's March of 1867, Bob was an integral part of UCLA's first undefeated season when he was the fifth in 1967, and he was one of the most valuable ones in the 1968. He became the first room voters to ever make the U.S. national state so he could give the pair of talks of the in the world chapter. In 1972. From there, he chose to UCLA track in 1975 and placed third at the, at the Western Center. In the fall of 1979, Bob became UCLA head coach and remained in this role in the spring of 1985. Bob's coaching achievements include a varsity win over Cal at the Estuary in 1984 and Harvard in 1982. Pac 10 crew coach of the year in 1981, assistant U.S. national team coach of the USA bronze medal winner in 1984. And in 1983, the varsity competed in the IRA's at 1350 yards in the same I'll highlight Dr. Coach a lot of great guys. Coach Bob Newman, thank you very much for your service. <laughs> UCLA coach Mike Still, please stand. <laughs> My younger, but not so little, brother Mike attended the College of the Redwoods in 19. Where he played basketball. And he graduated from UCLA in 1987 with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, minor in Kinesiology. Mike was a three year resident at UCLA from the fall of 1985 to the spring of 1987. After graduating, Mike wrote at the 1987 World Championships in Copenhagen, Denmark, where he and Vincent won a gold medal. Another highlight of my staff experience was winning the Stairs race in the 1992 Barcelona Olympics. I continue to go at the master's level at the Gallus in the United States and around the world. I the Charles Kelly and World Masters growing the Gallus. He plays the way and he plays how the voters to this day. He served as UCLA's Strong Models coach in the 1989-90. And Mike Stuglich, the freshman won the San Diego Crew Classic in 1990, and that group went into the Pac 10s when they played second. So it's Mike Still, thank you very much for your service. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
UCLA Earth Coach, Brandon McEwen. Please stand. Brennan had graduated from Georgetown University in 2010, so he did not go to UCLA. But as a coach, he represented UCLA in various regards. For example, the head of the Charles, where he won the men's Master of Single Skulls in 2018. Brennan was coaching, had been coaching at UCLA since 2016, and served the following roles. In 2016 and 17, he was the Barack Obama's coach. In 2018, he was the assistant varsity coach, and this year he's serving as a first coach, and he practices on that. At ACRA, Brendan Strauss Novice came to spend his ninth in 2016 and 10th in 2017, contributing to the UCLA Coach and the UCLA Coach in 2016. Further, Barack Novice has been his third at the campus in 2017.
UCLA's new head coach, Marcel Steffi. <laughs> He's dead. Marcel graduated from the University of San Diego in 2010, earning a Bachelor of Science in Political Science. He rode from Orange Coast College from 2007 through 2009, and then trained with a group of this at the University of Science Center in Hollywood again at the Andrews in 2011 through 2012. Marcel began his coaching career as a volunteer assistant at Orange Coast College in 2011. In 2012 to 13, he coached the junior library crew of Long Beach. And from 2013 to 19, he was head novice coach at the New York Aquatic Center. In addition, he was an assistant coach last season at Orange Coast College. Marcel credits a lot of what he knows today from his time training at Leander in Great Britain. Once again, he rode there in 2011 to 11 At the time, Team GB was preparing to go on the Olympics. In addition, while coaching at Newport Aquatic Center over six seasons, Marcel coached 27 regional championship winning boats. His crews also spent the last five seasons at the top of the podium of San Diego Crew Classic, the coach from the Newport Aquatic Center. On the collegiate level, while coaching at Orange Coast College last year, his baby age medal in the for the first time in two years. He also had a big role in leading both the novice age and the second novice age for victories in both Gira and Accra. Thank you very much for your service to you, Marcel Stiffy. Thank you very much for your service to you, Sarah. Started just is something I do before anytime I get up in a room full of 200 people, I grab my phone and I take a selfie. <laughs> All right, well, that's out of the way. Well, guys, welcome. Thanks for coming. It's, it's great to see so many Bruins in one, one spot. You know, I was getting around and Meeting at all of you and you know, getting to hear the stories of you know, who coached you, what brought you to this program, you know, what you learned. And for me, what brought me to coaching crew was people took time out of their day to give back to me. And people took time out of their day to mentor me and teach me the lessons in a rowing shell that you don't ever forget. And I promise you that, guys, who are on the team right now. Uh, one of the things that I've Coming into the program with it's a lot of energy. Um, there's been a lot of learning throughout the season, and you know, I think when you come down to this boathouse at six o'clock every morning, you have to come with an open mind. And one thing I've learned from this crew is if they've come down, they've been willing to learn throughout the process. It's been nothing but growth throughout here. So, you know, I think for us to start the season out winning the head of the Charles. And then now going into races where Jim Jorgensen's announcing and we're saying, hey, we're up six seats on Cal. That's a great feeling for all of us. And I know that we all can share that. Um, you know, it's proud to know. So, this is next time about the athletes. It's about 1973. You know, this photo was one of the first things I saw when I walked into the boathouse in the Marina Aquatic Center. It gave me a sense of, of tradition. It gave me a sense of that I needed to fulfill the winning tradition. Okay, and you know that's important. So I think I'd like to pull up Dom. We're going to have people talk about our graduated seniors. So uh, you know, I think for now, let's have Dom here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, Dom. <laughs> Tom said a tremendous job, you know, rallying the truth, so let's just thank him for that. And juniors who are speaking, you know, you want to say some more here. Okay. So we have a tradition here at UCLA where we give a special award to the seniors that have been here for four years. They are really the, the lifeblood of, life of this program, and we want to honor them in a special way. The way we do that is we have the junior class speak a little bit about each one. So I think 
Zero for a zero, okay? Eric, you see the balance of the so this is Eric. Alright, first up, we have active spirits. So, above all, the extreme amount of spirits grants. Often, often, the injuries get in the way of active spirits, also, even the good way to support. Uh, but not this active. Every time an injury could get the most, um, able to step back. In the mode to keep her and the very, very inspiring. Um, the fighting, the fighting spirit also shows up every day practice. Um, he's, he's never satisfied with how the boat's going, he's always looking for ways that he can improve as he goes. The boat makes those make sure that our boat is one and we cross the finish line. Um, so, and, and then this, this athlete's unwillingness to love something that we all learn from. Um, is that whatever reason, like whatever, whatever gets in your way, whether it be a bad injury, a bad row, uh, a row or getting back to the boat is the first step for a back to success. Thank you for being such an inspiration. Tyler, come up to the door. Next 
couple up here since you like. Matt will be three seat in the varsity. Come on. <laughs> Hurricane Ben, Benco side, on the Canadian side, I want to share a few words about our father co side, one of our fierce team leaders, and two seasons. Some of his highlights throughout the past four years include being a two time champion of the first Cross Triathlon, the victory at the head of the trial last fall. <laughs> and please watch out this holiday season because the man can craft any an entire Trader Joe's kids in the house get better than any of us. It's been a lot of fun getting to know Ben the past few years. He's one of those guys who enjoys the simple things in life. He prefers the scenic route to class and the short. He chooses to pound me because that's where they get a cool sandwich is better than the same. There's anything to take away from this that Ben keeps his head down, does the work, loves the process, and knows how to do it. Coastline is an animal on the earth, on the water, and on race day. Not only can we use this pain, as of last weekend, I learned something great. But a lot of us were left red and fried under the Newport sun, so it's time to make on journey. It makes no sense. <laughs> Therefore, Coastline is greater than the sun. Therefore, Coastline is inevitable. <laughs> If you'd like to hear more of my conspiracy theories on the matter, please don't hesitate to grab my email after the language. <laughs> Besides this quality, Cosine keeps the boat in proper balance, which is yelps from battle. And every time I turn around and see his head poking out wearing those sleek black Russian sleepers by open sunglasses, I have full confidence in him. We'll all miss seeing Ben next year, so we might as well send him off the best season in his career. So thank you, Ben, and the rest of the senior class for showing us what it means. Ben will be two seats tomorrow on the varsity. Uh, okay, I will be talking about the next one. This person took on a strange challenge when they came to UCLA. They joined a men's team for an obscure sport where we all hop in vans at 5 a.m. and drive 15 miles south of campus and move boats around for a few days. And this person doesn't actually grow. It's their job to tame the eight brutes in the boats to follow their every word. And they can't blink and, and they have to pay attention because if not, they want to to smash a $65,000 investment. Thank you, Bob. It's the life of the concert. I've had the pleasure of getting to know this person over the last four years, both as a teammate and as a coach. She is one of the few athletes that can ban balance, rowing, internship, schoolwork, with a smile on her She's always smiling, always happy, which is great, great to see as a coach. From a timid novice, Kate Hurt has blossomed into a fierce competitor, a proficient coach, and a strong leader, and I feel honored to be with this award. Kate will be coxing the boat tomorrow, varsity eight. First, right? First? All right, so I'm, I'm next. I'm next. This guy, Chase Gabby, he's our president. Uh, Chase Backbrand, I think it's Gabby, right? <laughs> Chase, thank you. You do so much for the team. You, you lead by example. You're an athletic specimen who somehow is still struggling with the rowing stroke. We're going to figure it out. We're going to figure it out. Chase and I, we both share a similar interest in diving, lobster diving. Uh, so one time we go out, it's, it's, it's a way for us to, to bond and get to know each other. And Chase, you're one of the bravest son of the guns I know. And I, I don't think that these guys understand how powerful that is. You're willing to go to whatever measure to succeed. 
And we will for, we'll never forget that. The guys who are sophomores, and you need to look at Chase and see that's how it's done. Because he handles himself with respect. He demands more out of each one of us. He keeps all of us accountable. Thank you, Chase. I'll never forget you. And I hope you will friends for forever. So, thank you. I don't shake their hands very often after the row, so for me to shake his hand, that's a good deal.
Wine. Dude, it's good. Wine? One one bottle of wine in and everything's good. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Oh wait, shit. Is that unmuted? Oh no. <laughs> Time to uh, start with our keynote address. Keynote speaker, and some amazing videos of the 1970s. Bartender crew. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, the next uh, section, and you can you know, continue while we're uh, while we're uh, the, the next, our, our featured, uh, our keynote speaker. Uh, I, I did uh, introduce him a little bit earlier as one of our future coaches. Uh, the 1969-70 crew, he was a coach for many years, but he was the, the coach of our 50th anniversary, golden anniversary crew, Jerry Johnson. Jerry, come on up. Several people asked me, how come you won the race in Seattle and the time was 6.049 for both folks? And that in itself is a good story because the Pocock, Stan, and his father both believed that any race that was within a jack was a tie. And it should be going to both crews. So at the finish line, in front of 80,000 people in Seattle, these two crews come into the cut, dead even, stroke for stroke with each other, and they cross the line. And at the finish line, there was a judge from UCLA and a judge from the University of Washington. The University of Washington coach or judge said, you know. UCLA said, UCLA. And they both turned to Stan Pocock, knowing that he always believed that it was a tie. And he said, I'm sorry, I have to call it for UCLA. <laughs> and you know, obviously, if you want to have a long banquet, all you need to do is invite the same coaches as you can possibly find. So, thank you to all the coaches. Um, and there's also a very large group of my, uh, wonderful Orson and Cousins and, and friends here. So, I'm wondering if just for a second, if the Jerry Joker, anybody who wants to be Stand up. <laughs> That's not a bad looking group 50 years ago. Not bad at all. Uh, and and I, uh, I've been Banning around what I'm going to do and what I'm not going to do, and the important and glad to hear that I am not going to uh, tell the 36 Olympic story again. The, uh, the other thing is, I, in order to make it a little bit better this time around, because the, the guys on the boat want to do some things afterwards, I want you to know that I've timed this when I practice my solo week, and I timed it, and it turns out that I can finish this speech. In the time it takes me to walk a mile. So the problem is, I'm a slow walker. So you'll have to put up with it. The, the 70 crew came together. Uh, when we saw the race in Washington up there in, in Seattle, to begin with, I, I tended to not be very nice to them. And that week, we probably rode as hard as we had at any other time during the year. My goal, my vision, was that we would win the Western Sprint. Winning in Seattle would be great, but we needed to win the Western Sprint. As a matter of fact, the night before we raced the Huskies, the crew went 12 miles. 
We went all the way down Lake Washington to the old racing course. We went all the way into Union Bay and down to the docks. We went around Sandpoint Naval Station and finally came back. And they're all looking at me like, you know we're going to race tomorrow. Like <laughs> and it wasn't the first time, yeah. So, so I like to welcome all of the future, past, present, toxin, origin, significant others, coaches, to a very wonderful banquet. And the UCLA, we had a huge tradition. And, and I'd like to tell you just a little bit about me first, because I keep all of my life getting asked, why? Group. And for years and years and years, my only answer was, why not? <laughs> and, and then I thought, well, maybe I need to come up with something a little bit better than that. So I thought back to my freshman year when a young, a, 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 a young man, a young man came up and, and so I came back to the boathouse the next day and there were two 16 person concrete parties. And ores that were spiced down to nothing. You're going to try and turn it off. I think they like that more than me. Anyway, uh, so I waited, and this little guy with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth came over and said, There's an empty seat. And it just happened that that seat was the last seat on the right in the stern of the boat. And that's why it became a stroke. There was no grand plan. I had no idea that was going to happen. I didn't even know why I went there. I went to register for classes down into the, the basketball court, and as I'm walking down the banner above the step, it's about eight foot by point, and it says, too short to be a forward? Too slow to be a guard? So I grew. So I did. So I kept going back. And you know, if people believe in external motivation, if they believe you can force people to do things that they don't want to do, if you believe that external stimulus can make a person change what they're doing, I was cut nine times. And I didn't quit. Now, I'm going to try and tell you why I didn't quit tonight and why these guys were so good at sitting here. But it was, I had to figure that out for myself. At the beginning of the, of the spring break, they had cut us down to six boats. And we all lived in the boathouse at the University of Washington. And the sixth boat was the boat I was in and I was stroking. And I knew those guys in that boat pretty well because most of them had been cut the same time I had. And this little guy was a little guy with a cigarette just happened to be John Bissett, who was the coach at UCLA from 63 through 68. Okay, so I'm I'm getting cut and I'm getting and they're getting cut. And after about three days of spring break, we went out together. I mean, we ate together, we laughed together, we did everything. We got ignored by everybody. We went out and we bought some yellow t-shirts. This is the trickle down, trickle on syndrome. We figured we've been cheated so many times, so we would wear yellow. Now, here's what it's like in those days with no one on it. The coach looks across six boats, and the coach says, Are you the one who's going to be? No, 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 no. And we look at each other, and the coxswain looks at, and everybody starts rowing. So we start rowing. You know, and, and our goal was, no matter where the first boat was, we are going to be as close to it as we could. And we did that for four days. On the fifth day, and in the seat of box was fixed on the board, and our yellow t-shirt shirt group was in the second boat spot. And now we can hear the coach. And we discovered we were supposed to be taking 40 strokes. We didn't know how many strokes we were supposed to take. We just wanted to make sure we kept up. We were told we were supposed to roll at 24. We didn't know that. We just tried to keep up. But lo and behold, somehow we kept up. After the undefeated championship was beat Cornell by open water 10 seconds, I remember coming back to my fifth year reunion as we guys went down. And six guys from that second boat came up holding their yellow shirt. They said, if you hit our stroke, we were going to answer them. And all I gotta tell you, that's their business. They believe 
that they could do it. And they did what they did. They were incredible. They're doctors, they're lawyers, they're you know, successful businessmen today. Why did we keep going back? Okay, I'll have time to think about it. I gotta go off the off the beat for a second. I have a neighbor who late in life had a baby. He was, I think, 44. And this little two-year-old next door was serious about it. And I'm still working on behavioral modification, trying to figure out what's going on. And I watched this little boy walk into the living room. And there on the table, always, is a bowl of m and And he walks into the room, and he sees the m and with the eye water. And then he goes over to his brother and says, Mom, can I have two, please? And mom is so pleased that he said, please, that she gives him four. And I'm telling you, babies are born with very little learned behavior. Everything after the first week and a half is learned behavior. He learned, please, God him more. A lot of kids learn, can't for me, get all what they want. Thank goodness, can't for me, for most people, only lasts for a short period of time. And then it goes away. And I don't think it's because it's negative reinforcement. I watched it. So, the little boy, two days later, he walked into the room. Dad's reading the paper. Dr. Joe walks over to the end of the takes a handful and leaves the room. So I see he's learning something other than tweet. The next time I see Joe, Grandma's sitting on the bus, on the on the couch. And, and Grandma's sitting there, he's not going, he jumps into Grandma's lap. And opens his mouth and grabs himself putting M&Ms in it. So I'm thinking, people learn things for interesting reasons. And now what about food? Why is it that we like food and what was it? And I think it's the same reason that little boy is learning how to get M&Ms better and better all the time. My boat, this boat from 70, sitting all over the place here, they really, really liked each other. They fought like brothers. They fit in each other, but they believe in each other. They have a love and brotherhood that it was worth it to do for them. The second thing was they were getting better and better as they were working. Their competency was going up, their ability to row was going up, their confidence was going up. They felt good. The next thing was they didn't to be there and nobody could stop them like nobody could stop them. They came back and they can't tell you what the stories they can tell because there were things they did that just caused them to laugh and feel they could cry. So with those four things, brotherhood, power, some sort of choice, freedom, and then add in which the fun and the they had in growing made it so need fulfilling that I could not work them so hard that they would quit. They always came back. They always did. We got Duncan down here who gives us the length in the boat. We got Jeff and we got Jim who jumped the strokes so they will go up. We got the middle three. And that's uh Dean is in here right now, but we got the Wonski and Bob Baldwin who go on each side of the boat here to death with these. And then we have the bow pair that lifts the bow and they go back. And that was what made it go. People have asked me. Why is this really good work not in our No one answered. The boat was back, and it's amazing they put up the sand and tell you what to do all the time. So it was an amazing group, and they stood together and they did everything extremely well. But they they could not be stopped. I want a vision just like that. When my crew and I was a senior. And we went through the winter trials, and we finished the trip behind the Vesper Boat Club, which was the first non-college team to represent the United States in the Olympics. It was the men against the board, and we just got blown out of the water. Harvard was absolutely incredible. We could not face them. They got us into the record club. Yale was good. We couldn't, the Marcy Boat couldn't take them. They got them into the record club. And then Cal was the national champion. 
And we didn't get to race that, but we wanted to. But we raced our largely both of these things. And you know what? I lost that race. But all of these needs, the guys in that boat need to have loved it. We have the choice. We decided to go, even though we've been put in the big boat and we knew the coach had lost his mind, we still stuck with it. We made the choice to do it. We were getting better. We could see it. We could prove it. We could it. And we had more fun than we should have had. As you, you will all do as you keep on going. I want you to think of a vision. And know that it has to include not just winning. It has to include more than finishing ahead of the others to the true way. It also has to do that you did that with your brother, with the people that are in your boat. It was an amazing time to go through that whole thing because we beat Washington at Long Beach by, it wasn't only so much, but it was a win. Uh, they really had a lot of fun. You see a lot of pictures of the game, but it was, it was something that they earned. I'm asking those of you that are going to be orphans, or are orphans now, oxen, coaches, what is your vision? What is it that you want to accomplish in your life? What is it you want to do that when you look back from 50 years, you will go to a banquet because you want to see those guys one more time? And it's been a long time, 50 years. And I, I am so pleased to see so many of you here. I didn't recognize Bob Newman, but other than that. <laughs> so, so right now we'd like to show you a short clip, a short little video of what it was like when we rode in 1970. Yeah? Oh, you're hoping somebody knows how to do it? I can see the problem right now why he's having trouble. The wine glass is empty. Oh, and, and, and I'm sorry, I did forget. We have two that aren't here tonight. Out of the nine on the boat, we lost Rita Brown, Paul Mary before that. He was vital to the whole thing. Part of the reason we were a bucket boat, we had this, the two starboards at four and five, was because Rita helped me look at how Sandy had to drift, he had to steer all the time. And um, we lost him a few years ago, and we just lost Dean Hansen. And Dean was the the absolute engine that ran our boat. You'll see him on the thing. He is the one with his hands on his shoulders. He's also the one that would break an oar when we needed it done. All the way to UCLA Men's Road, that are called the slide. Awesome. Thank you. 
Okay, well, why don't you uh, and your guys come on up? We don't have enough music here, so why don't you come up and start your speeches and just let the back down? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, what's the fashion by Coach Jim Jorgensen? Thank you. 
So, anyway, that's that's my two cents. Anybody else wants to speak? There's a microphone. There's not many of us that rode while we were in high school. So, oh, where am I from? I'm Finch Born Seattle by a man of both. And Jerry Johnson is the only place we ever had in the class of 71. And uh, the first person I met, the first people I met, who had anything to do with crew, was the boss of the president. And they came to my dorm room and convinced me on why I should go up to the crew. And you know, look back on the history and the coaches and the win, but yeah, sure, we had some losses. But, you know, we were able to stand on the shoulders of some really kind people. And we had a great trade opportunity. And I, I want to talk about the 1970s because we had lost to Long Beach and Stanford and uh, Irvine and Orange County. And folks called us together and said, we're having a Sunday workout. And we show up. And the boat was totally rigged. It was in a German rig. And I rode five on starboard. We rode four on starboard. And Dean scared the heck out of me. <laughs> uh, he picked me up once at a party just to introduce me to people. And went on the road. He's one of the strongest individuals I've ever met. But we put the boat on the water that day. And it was magical. And after we got off, we all knew it. Coach Johnson pushed off my list. And we all have to refer to the original. It did not do that. So it was simply this week. But we lost that race. And the following week we go up to Washington. There's 50,000 plus people on the race course. I live in Seattle now. And folks lined up on Washington. And Waves and uh, backwash and everything that you can imagine. And we took off and we saw the race earlier. We got down to the end of the race and a classy sandy place, 20 more. And I had this thing that took off in my head. And I got down to about six. And he goes, 20 more. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you who have a coxswain, you know what? <laughs> and after about six strokes, he goes, Okay, wait a minute. And we were, we were in Pennsylvania, or we were watching the Pennsylvania there. So, uh, it's Johnson and the Brown come up. And uh, my first guy, and we all said, Who won? And he goes, You did. And that's the picture you see later, which is on the front page of Seattle Times. And 20 years later, when we brought the strength to Lake Tacoma, I was with my daughter and we were going to the race to stay over the world side of the church. I found that on the t-shirt that the pole that that was that shirt. <laughs> and went to the car to my wife and said, hey, that's the shirt. That shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and we went home and found that shirt. Today, that hangs on my wall, and it certainly hangs on the wall of 35 years. But, you know, 50 years seems like yesterday. And those of you that are going through it today, you're fine. You can look back today and say, wow, what an experience. It certainly set the course today and uh, the life I've had. And I want to thank everybody in this boat, thank you, and the coach, and the coach, as well, for all the Good times, bad times, and uh, fun times. Thank you.
you ever been in sports? Yeah, I swam in high school. Well, we'd like to come out and be I said, why? Little did I know that when I graduated high school, I was 5'2", 95 pounds. That makes a good time. Besides the memories of these four years at college, what I had with these guys will last a lifetime. We spent four years together out on the water. We spent the rest of our lives as friends. So for all you new sportsmen growing today, you have a lot to look forward to.
sitting on our butts way too long. I want every man, woman, child on your feet right now. from now I may decide to slow this down a little bit. You know, uh, everybody talks about how they got into the sport. Well, I guess I'll tell my story. I was down at, uh, at uh, Orange Coast, and a guy by the name of Bush Bowl came up to me and comes up with a clipboard, and he goes, oh, what's your name? We had some tag on it. They were more official. I said, just man, we just like this. Oh, my God. You missed your first class, and if you don't come down to the class uh, that you're assigned, um, you're going to have a little problem. So you missed your first class, and here's a piece of paper. Make sure you're there tomorrow afternoon at 3 o'clock. Well, 3 o'clock is a boathouse. And we go down to the boathouse on uh, Newport, and there's probably about half a dozen of us going, okay, so what class are we in? So what are we doing? And then the coach comes in and says, oh, I'm glad that you guys volunteered to come down here for the sport of crew. So, a lot of us got hoodwinked into this sport. <laughs> Here's the difference. Crew is not only a team sport, it's an individual sport. What you got to do is, is you got to make up your mind that you're going to do the best you can every single day. Jim Laswell was right. The guys in the second boat, they're as valuable as the guys in the first boat, without question. Because if they're not being pushed, if the first boat isn't being pushed, if you're not doing everything you can to try and get in that first boat, then you're missing the opportunity of what rowing is all about. Because at the end of your rowing career, what you want to be able to do is you want to say, I did everything I could, every practice, every day, I went down there. And I'm telling you, it will change your life. All these guys will tell you, that's what makes it work. And that's the part with passion. You learn passion. You learn ferocity. Because you're going to do everything you can. You're going to put that blade in exactly the best you can. You're going to make your arms the best you can when Marcel is yelling at you. And you feel like you're really stupid, push hard. Because that's essentially what makes rowing such a unique sport. I tell people, yeah, I got no sport where you sit on your butt and go backwards. <laughs> people won't understand that, but this really is a unique sport. It's a sport of camaraderie. And that's essentially what we have out there. And that's why we were lucky that we just kind of. Got it all to happen, and we have a phenomenal boat that did some phenomenal things. And I can't tell you how proud I am of these guys that they still think I'm okay. Which really surprises me. <laughs> okay, well, some of them do. Some of them do. Now, let's take a boat. <laughs> so, keep up the good work, guys. It's great to see this crowd. Um, anyway, come back here for every banquet, be part of this program. And uh, this is not an easy program. I mean, the university isn't funding it. They're not uh, encouraged by it. The only reason that we live is because you won't die. So keep that in mind. Support the program, and thank you very much. Hi, my name is Terry Ossadol. I rode six in uh, 68, 69. And the end of the seventh season. I wasn't in the pictures of boat at the end of the season, but I wanted to come up and say why. Um, Jim and I were uh, in that boat in 69, so and, and six. Uh, I came back for uh, four years, stayed in college for 50 years ago. I think I did my first year on the boat. But, um, Duncan Henderson was so busy, so. And uh, he 
we call him the king of swing because he made everybody go really behind the street. It almost felt easier when they were going behind it. So Coach moved him up to the slow seat. I think Coach was just doing that for him. I was still on the right to go. I was going to go back to the seat. Sooner or later, it was a big deal. Okay, there you go. There you go. For some brilliant reason, uh, Coach Nelson moved around the seat. I was crushed. But uh, it took me a, a long time to get over that. I was just kind of broke that stuff until I started to go down. It was all about the team. That's what we were about. And I was all about coaching that team. That first coach was back to coach the team. I was the first coach to get back to coach the team. And I was the first coach to get back to coach the team. Teamwork is one of the big learning things that I took away with me from the program. Very much into the rest of my life. Of course, it's wonderful to have friends, lifelong friends, but uh, I think teamwork is what I've modeled through my business career, through my days and years of community service in a lot of different ways, through modeling teamwork in my friends and family relationships. My wife and I are committed together to modeling the team. <coughs>
two things. The safety is the safety is behind you that the one who wants to explain easily over watching the line that door and I can say to you. And that signaled everybody along the way that we were full in the JV, the second boat, we had people who were going to come on and be strong all the way in my like year 70. We had the best way to go to the top of your head and back and forth, back and forth. You fought for your seat every day you were there. And that's what you think. You need to know that your seat is never there. It's somebody who's taken it in. Gary spoke to that exact thing. It's heartbreaking when you get up to see, but you never give it up to see because you always fight to get to that. And the last thing I'm going to say, and this is sort of the of what I'm going to say, the classic seven years, the first time I'm going to so it's lost. So we had a terrific class that came in and filled the boathouse with people who graduated. We graduated probably 10 to 12 people that came in the class. When you're out there, fill your class with people because I'll tell you what, it makes your boat go faster, it fills the bars, it fills the team, and it fills your life because these people are your friends for the rest of the my name is Bob Holter, and I kind of came from that forage background, but also I grew up in a forage background. But it's called the Vera, which is about two kilos. So when I came to UCLA, uh, they had a boat out in front. And I played some water sports, swam, surf, didn't know anything about crew, but they said, Come down, so I went down. So I was a freshman year, interesting. But uh, we couldn't make the varsity at that time. I didn't know the weather, so it was a big deal. Next year was important. You had every practice, you did everything they say, you work it all the way through, you can't walk when you go home. Tell you how bad it is. A couple of guys who have here remember this. We got thrown out and privileged to die at Sir George's Sporting Sport. Good to have us come back. So you guys can do that. I also had a privilege to room with a couple of guys that are kind of legends. Uh, Dean Hanson's one of them. And uh, he and Butch both and I. Had a little one bedroom apartment over a single car garage behind Hamburger Hamlet of the Public Center. So it's $75 a month for that, and I share it with $25. And so I could go and live someplace. And they both cook, so just throw a little money in the pot and make, make dinner for that. So I'm going to go back to the last part That's kind of the side story. That's how you get close. They were two great guys that taught me a lot about life. We used to be out of the fights that they would get out of for him. Go to the pantry and come back to the apple pen and we were back. So, uh, <laughs> for a guy that lived in an orchard, you know, I'm learning a lot about life. I've never seen it before. I'm looking at someone like that. He's here. Is there a garbage here? Would you stand up for me? Outside the bar, she go up from 67, 8, 9, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, 7, I was always in a boat where I just had to work really, really hard because I didn't want to be in second place and neither did they. And we ate a lot of lunch of us, but pretty good for us table guys. Yeah, thank you all. You're the guys I remember. That's exactly true. So, 
It's a big panorama of what happens when you're a rower. And it's really nice to win, and it's really nice to go fast, but it's also really nice to have good memories of the guys that you spent the five months with so you could have two months. So thank you all. Thank you, Campaign, if you uh, aren't aware of it, called Our Chats and Student 
campaign. We're trying to raise our endowment funds as well. And we've learned that the UCLA office has some tremendous resources for alumni in gift planning, maybe securities to the endowment fund, real estate. If you want to donate the investment real estate, they have the ability to actually sell it when the time comes and donate that to the group. I have a whole bunch of information from our office of planning giving. If you're interested, please see me or Katie McPherson after the after the uh, We have several other campaigns. There's a golf tournament coming up. Please join us. These are meant to both build the community as well as help fund this group. Okay. Overall, we have a goal this year of two hundred eighty thousand dollars that we want to raise. The rest of that is coming from dues and students portion. So our goal. First is 260, but then we want another 20 to go back into the endowment. Our voting before is $208,000. And today we are 75% to plan. <laughs> With your help, you know, I mean, the people who contribute to the Empower campaign, the people who give on SparkWeb, the people who give online, the people who give in so many ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you for all of your support and the engine room donors. An engine room donor, by the way, is someone who makes a five-year commitment, and every year they give the same amount. We have some as high as hundred thousand dollars, getting twenty thousand dollars a year, and other ones very large. I'd like to pause and give a little bit of reference for what what this amount means for us in the competitive program. Last week at the race. Uh, I had the chance to talk to one of the Cal coaches, and I just asked him, tell me about your friends at Cal Rowan and how you guys raise funds, and I learned a couple of really, really important points. Our budget, uh, as you saw, was $320,000. The Cal budget is one one over two of So they raise all of that money. Cal Rowan raised about $450,000 a year, that's a 60% block. They're raising more money. And they also have a single donor that matches it. So together, that's $900,000. And then the university picks it up. So it's tremendous. Community of lower several ways, right? Enormous number of uh, supporting the program. Thank you again for your support. We're going to try to become more competitive again with Cal. Okay. Let me, um, I have to read this next part again because I find my glasses. While financial support is certainly one of the key to success of our program, it's not the only one. John Wooden shared his definition of success, and you all know it. The most important part of that definition for me is having the will to do your best in the first place. Having the will to succeed. You've got to want it. Building this program to achieve the vision of success that Kevin and Dom have described in various formats will take outstanding athletes and competitors, best in class coaching, strong administration support, incredibly supportive parents and friends, strong financial support. And the will to succeed in each one of those areas. I believe that we have everything we need right here in this room tonight. We don't have to look outside for major new vendors, major new donors. We don't have to look outside for foreign recruits or anybody else to pull our vote for us. We have champions among us here tonight. We are in UCLA. From UCLA's first group in 1933 to today, there is an unbroken chain of oarsmen and women who have walked on, turned out, and tested their mettle. Whether you rode for one year or four, competed in the third, second, or first boat, Eat here at UCLA or went on the road for the U.S. national team. You pushed yourself to be the best you could be. 
and in pushing yourself beyond what you thought you were capable of, you also pushed your teammate to be the best he or she can be. The will to succeed is one of the most important things that connects us across generations of this group. When you get to UCLA Men's Rowing, you are invested in young men and women who are choosing the more difficult path at UCLA because they know it will make them stronger. People who self-select a life of full-time academics and full-time athletics, and sometimes full-time jobs, family, internships, research, and more. It is not easy for them. It shouldn't be. Worthy goals are never easy, right? But the alumni in the room, I'd ask you to look around at the current crew. You were a lot like them when you, you showed up at the vote house every morning. When they leave UCLA, like you, they will know who they are and what they are made of. They will become the next generation of leaders like you in technology, medicine, law, finance, international business, and more. When you join with FOR's mission to support these, you join a group of leaders who understand that worthy goals do not come easy, that adversity and setbacks and hard work are not optional. In fact, they are requirements on a journey. You join a group that understands that the road of champions runs right through Berkeley and Washington. It always has. When you join with Ford, you join a group of leaders who understand that you have to overcome self-doubt, limitations, and excuses to transcend. To, and find your, to transcend and find your true potential. You have to take the hits, work harder, and die 10 seconds later than the guy in the next boat over. That's how champions are built. And that's who we are. Every year, the Cayenne Bright Challenge Cup travels to Sacramento and goes home with the fastest V8 in the Pac-12. Only three teams have ever won this cup. Cal, Washington, and UCLA. The winner of this cup usually top two or three in the country, is often the national champion. The winner of this cup usually sends several athletes to the U.S. national team. Competitors for this cup know that they are testing their medal with the best student athletes in the world. Over the next eight years, with the Olympics coming back to LA in 28, many competitors for this cup will represent Team USA here at home. Some of you in this room may be on that team. This crew has set its vision. They want it. They want UCLA engraved on this cup. Tell them what that's that is a worthy goal. Will you join with four and help this crew achieve that goal? When you give the UCLA men's rowing, whether time, the talent, or your treasure, I, I'd like to ask you to remember who you are and to remember that you are and remain a critical part of this extended team. If I may be so bold, remember your time in the boat. 
you want our current oarsman to give just enough to get through this piece? You want them to hold something back, saving it for the next thousand days of spring? You want them to let somebody else in the boat carry their weight? Or do you want them to go the wind? Then I have to ask, as you and I did tonight, should we give just enough to get through this piece? Or do you really want to Thank you for supporting these strong young men and women that strive to become the best that they are capable of becoming. <clears throat> Thank you for keeping the legacy of UCLA men's crew strong and unbroken, linking one generation to the next since 1933. Go Bruins, keep Yeah, we to see the live option. Starting to see some action and some increased heads. Um, uh, before we start the live auction, I just want to let everybody know that um, we'll be closing the live auction, the side of the auction in about 10 minutes. So if you see something you want, get on to the live auction website. Uh, raise your hand. We have students here on the down. Right there. Side of auction. How many guys need some help? Okay, right over here. Who else needs some help for that? Okay. <clears throat> You gotta understand all these old alumni, we were barely able to deal with our cell phones. So the fact that uh, these guys with the hats are gonna help you out. So if there's one right over here, where are you guys going? Over on this side. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so here's what's going on down the hotel. We've got two brand new M pockets. Come on, guys. Come on. These boats are some of the best boats ever in the history of mankind. Okay. And one of the things that's really fascinating about these boats, first off, my hat's off to Bob Newman. Bob Newman, stand up for a second. Stand up. One of the boats is named Bob Newman because it came from Bob Newman. And that was an incredibly generous gift. Bob Newman is one of those guys that's been one of the basic foundation supporters of this program, and I think everybody ought to give him a hand for the beautiful and all of the people in heart. The other book is a name Mike Bennett, and that was put up by the guys who rode under Bennett, and they raised the money, they bought the boat. Get up, Mike, so we can see your other day. <laughs> but notice that uh, when you see the boat, it's a lot prettier than, uh, than Mike is. But, Here's what the opportunity is. We name the seats. The people who buy a seat get to sit there, and these boats will be out on the water for 10, 12, maybe 15 years. And there are going to be hundreds of guys who get in that seat and see your name at that seat and some institutional or suggestive memo that you have. I have a seat down there that says Passion, what does it say? Passion, Purpose, Team. I think I have a lot of guys come back to me and say something about it. And my point is, is having your name on a seat in the boathouse is really something special. You go down to the boathouse, you see your name in that boat, and you understand that you are part of the crew. And so what we're going to do here tonight, we're going to auction off the nine seats <clears throat> in the Varsity 2 Empire. The best boats that this program has ever had. And I mean it sincerely. And the guys out there, I was there when they first took these boats out. They come back off the water and they go, wow, this is so much better. It's really going to help us make this go a lot faster. Marcel was talking about it earlier, letting it spectacular. But in order to keep those boats going, in order to be able to afford those boats because it uh, costs a lot of money, we need to auction off these seats. So what we're going to do is <clears throat> we're start with Newman. Now, the, a, the, the 70 crew. The 70 crew would like to have their names in the Newman. The problem is, is that some people might not want that. We would like our names in the Newman, 
basically because we know a lot, and we like to have the, the oarsmen that were in that 70 championship boat in there. But our names would be minimal, and the name of the person who buys the seat would be maximum. In other words, their name, some encouraging slogan, and where they're from, and what they want to put down. We think that that would be good. How many of you, if you have been on a boat, think that's an okay idea? That's true. How many don't think it's a good idea? Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we're going to start auctioning off these seats. And generally, we start with the bow, but I'm going to start with the stroke seat tonight. We're going to start with the uh, no, no, no. We're going to start with the stroke seat, and I'm looking for somebody who wants to put their name in the Bob Newman stroke seat, and I'll take bids starting at 750 bucks. 750 bucks. So, I bet. <laughs> okay, I got a bid of 750 bucks for Mike Bennett. That's the stroke seat in the Newman. He'll be here for 10 to 15 years. Can I get a little bit better than 750 dollars Thousand bucks, thousand bucks. All right. It's about the normal price these seats go for. I got a thousand bucks from Kevin Still. Mike Bennett, you've been out there. Anybody's going to go for more than a thousand bucks for the stroke seat in the brand new Bob Newman boat? Thousand bucks, thousand bucks once, thousand bucks twice. Fifteen hundred from Jim Jordan. Bill 